Hello everyone, welcome to Megafon Sport. Uh, time for Rockford Rugby, and it's my absolute privilege to uh, welcome Clinton Scott here. He's the the founder and uh, I don't know what you call it, a chairman of the Lions Pride of Josie Facebook group, an uh, ardent Lions supporter, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome, Clinton. Thank you very much, Enver. Yeah, it's a privilege for me to be on your platform. Um, I've always uh, enjoyed your content and I look forward to actually posting it on my page each week or whenever there's content coming through. Yeah, we try and we try and do as much as we can about the, the various franchises. Uh, the line specifically, um, I started speaking to Tux Kotz uh, earlier this year, and uh, he sort of, you know, uh, kindled a bit of a, a flame for me with, with the Lions. I was never really a big Lions supporter. I was basically born and bred in Pretoria, so you know who I'm supporting. But as I started to get to know the players and started to know what's going on there, I started following them at the moment. They're, they're sort of my B team, you know, my second team that I support. And I enjoy that. Tell me, you as a Lions supporter, where did your love for the Lions start? And how did you get up, you know, end up starting a Facebook group? So, yeah, it goes back to my school days where it was still known as Transvaal. The Lions were then known as Transvaal. In the days of Yanni Breit, mm. um, I just used to love this guy's passion, his leadership on the field, never die, never die attitude, say die attitude, and yeah, um, it was also a difficult era for Transvaal because, I mean, they, they reached finals, but it was also the era when Lars Puerto was ruling the roost. So they would, like, put a good side in to those finals and then Lars would just come and kick his drop goals over. And, yeah, he was he was in his prime. So, yeah, that's where it really started for me was when it was Transvaal and under Yanni Breath's captaincy. I remember that specific final, you know, the one, uh, what was it, 87? When Lars just kept kicking like a metronome, one kick after the other, and I could see, I remember Yanni Bria's face in that final. Of course, I was on the other end, other side of the fence. I was ecstatic. I couldn't imagine how you, you must have felt. Yeah, I know. It was, it was heartbreaking. I mean, because he, yeah, he gave his all. And I mean, obviously, it was a good Transvaal side. And I think it was pouring rain that day. Um, mm. And Nas was just dictating everything. He was, he was brilliant. He was at his brilliant best. Uh, you decided to start a Facebook uh, support group or a Facebook page, as we know it, uh, Lions Pride of Josie. And that's now just recently, I remember you counting it down to reaching 6,000 followers, one of the biggest groups. Just tell us a bit more about the, the page, the idea behind it, what, you, what you're trying to, to, to achieve by, by, by having this page. So, yes, I've always followed like different Facebook pages, um, different rugby pages, even if it's other teams. And naturally... Lions rugby pages and then I decided to I'd love to start my own page but I wanted something unique I wanted to try and see if I could get ex-players and current players on uh, players families on you know so they can act, interact with us and yeah so I just wanted something unique uh, different to what the other pages were doing and I started the page it was during hard lockdown um, we obviously had a lot of time on our hands then mm. so I started this page and I was Facebook friends with some of the players and I started inviting them onto the page and then it just snowballed. The players were starting to invite their ex player, you know, um, teammates and that's how it happened. It just started rolling and rolling and we're actually celebrating four years now in April and yeah, 6,000 people on the page, about 160 past and present Lions players on. So it's, it's exactly what I was trying to achieve and it's, yeah, it's awesome. It's a nice thing about you know somebody like uh, like the lions and even the bulls to a degree. Once you once a lion, always a lion. Once a bull, always a bull. I see you wearing your red shirt there. You know, the, 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 the die to the core uh, kind of a supporter. T tell us about some of the names that are some of the players. I know Andre Petores is a follower of yours. We talk to you quite regularly, and he mentioned you to to me as well. One of the things, one of the reasons we got in touch. And uh, who else is on is on your platform? Well, it goes back to the 70s. There's players on this page, even from the 70s in the Kevin de Klerk era, uh, Paul Babel era, their families are on the page. There's the Transvaal winger, Johan van Weingart, that's on. And you come all the way through to current. I mean, we've got the likes of Jarpie Mulder on this page, uh, Chris Dirks. Um, we have the late Hannes Stradom on our page. Um, yeah, so there's so many Val Bartmans on the page. And then, like I said, right through to now, uh, Andre Pretorius and current players on. So yeah, there's I'm gonna miss many of those names, mm -hmm. but there's big names on the page. 
And are they involved? Are they active? I, I see you've, 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 you've somehow got some of them to make little videos and just to sort of shout outs and stuff like that. How involved are they in, uh, in the group? They're actually very, um, very involved and always willing to, to help out. So before our games each week, I'll either ask an ex-player or I'll ask a supporter just to send the team a motivation. And Andre Pretorius, for one, has done that quite a few times. Mm. Dolpis Lechran, see another one. Um, so yeah, they, they, they're keen to do it. And they just, they tell me like off the page, you know, how great it is for them as ex-players to have, to be part of this big family, you know, that's been brought together on social media. And uh, one of the big problems of any social media page, but especially, I suppose, Twitter and Facebook, is making sure you have the right people on your page. Now, can anybody join or do you screen them or how does it work? So, yeah, I definitely do screen them. And I generally look through the people's profiles to see something that indicates that they're a line supporter. I know you get a lot of pages where it's free for all and anybody can come on, but you can have friction on those type of pages or, you know, if you've got like supporters from all teams. So I try and screen it as closely as I can so that we just get line supporters on. But I mean, obviously there are other people on the page like yourself. I've got John von Rensburg on the page and I know he's a Bulls supporter. Mm. You know, you've got some free state people on the page, but those are guys that respect rugby as a whole. They are not going to say something about the lines or bring their team into it. They're going to respect it because it's rugby. Mm. So that's that's how we do it. But I definitely screen them. And anybody can just go onto Facebook. Uh, we put the link in the, in the description, and we'll try and put a link on the screen here. And then anybody's welcome to go go to the page and, and ask to be invited. Absolutely, yeah. They'll go onto Facebook, type in Lions Pride of Josie, go to the top of the page, click join, and then obviously it goes through like a um, where it would I'll be notified, and then I'll obviously accept. So what do you do for a living? Apart from sporting the lines, where do you live? Uh, yeah, so um, I grew up in Rustenburg and then I moved to Joburg. I was in hospitality, so I managed like, quite a few properties in Joburg. And I've only been back in Rustenburg recently. So I came back in 2021. COVID hit, so the industry was hit quite badly. A lot of us in management were retrenched, so I had to like start going into a different mm. field. And that's when I ended up in real estate. And fortunately, it's going well. So yeah, I'm selling properties in Rustenburg. And that's basically what I do this side. My aim is to go back to Joburg again once I've built a profile. But um, yeah, Josie boy, line supporter. <laughs> yeah, well, I know all about that. Like I said, I'm a Pretoria boy, born and bred. Died in the wool. Bull supporter. I live 200 <laughs> meters away from Loftus. I can't get any closer because they won't allow me. <laughs> okay. okay enough of the group now tell me let's talk about the lions a little bit i mean the, the lions you know apart from the glory is towards uh you know where towards the end of the super super rugby era i mean they played in a couple of finals the yon akramon sways the brain kind of era things haven't been going that well but this year things seems to have turned the corner cash and ruin to me seems to look like he's coming to a bit of his own as a coach, he's got a good team around him. Jacques Fourier is doing great work as a, as a defence coach. And they're doing very well. But there seems to be a bit of inconsistency. One week up, one week down. What is your feeling about the Lions season so far? And what do you attribute this inconsistency to? Yeah, exactly. Like you said, I mean, Lions supporters have been craving that success that we had under Ackerman. Um, and it's obviously been absent. So... Cash has been at the helm for a few years. There were a lot of supporters that said, why are they, you know, choosing a conditioning coach to take over as a head coach? You know, it's not the right mm. thing to do. And the management have stuck with him and they've believed in him. And like you said, suddenly this year, things have suddenly kicked into place. Um, he is surrounded by good rugby brains and that is, uh, you know, contributed to the, the success they've had this season. I mean, the likes of Jacques Free, like you said, on defence, You've got Barton Peterson, who's brilliant with line outs and he's general forward coaching. Julian Redling Hayes has always been good at scrums. And they had a very good preseason. They actually say they've had one of their best preseasons in years. And if you look when they started the season, it was close losses for them. Games that they could have mm. won, maybe a kick here or there that you know never went over. You never want to blame a referee because it's it's the players that need to, you know, produce. But I mean, we had some odd calls against us. If I just cast my mind back to the first game at Ellis Park where we played against the Stormers, 
It was a 35-33 loss. It was a missed kick. We could have taken that one. Then we went overseas. We had a run of games, also close defeats against Edinburgh. It was a one-point loss. Uh, I think we went on and lost by five points to Benetton. And so it went on. So there's those games that they should have won and could have won, and they didn't. Um, but it looked promising all along. They came back to South Africa and hammered the hammered Zebra, hammered the Dragons, um, beat the Sharks in Durban. So they were starting to build consistency. And then they had a close defeat to the Bulls in Pretoria. Mm-hmm. It was also two points or something. There was a no. kick. We all thought, here comes a big upset. And then they played the Bulls in a return match at Ellis Park. And then the wheels came off. So that comes to where you're asking this inconsistency. I don't know. The players, I've spoken to some of the players, and they say it's just soft moments in games. They've got a specific game plan that they follow, but it's moments in games where something just goes wrong or something doesn't work out, and they seem to lose the plot. And that's what happened in that Bulls game, that second Bulls game. Then they came back and proved all their doubts is wrong and smashed the Sharks by a huge margin at Ellis Park 40-10. Um, left and went overseas, beat Connacht, surprisingly, with only 14 players on the field. Yeah. I mean, they played that game for like, I think, 60-odd minutes with 14 players, and they thrashed them, a good Connacht side. But then they went on and took on Ospreys, and then the same, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, the same uh, soft moments crept back into the game again, like in the Bulls game, and they lost to Ospreys. So a person doesn't really know what it is, because when they turn up, I believe they can beat anybody on the day. But then they lose to teams that you expect them to beat, and it's just a consistency. They've just got to focus for like those 80 minutes um, in every game. It also doesn't help if you've got your kicker that's not getting all his kicks over and that mm. kind of thing, but you can't really blame him You know, only. It's the entire team that are not focusing possibly for like 80 minutes. When Tips and I started talking about the Lions, he was adamant that the Lions will end up in fifth place in the UFC. And I'm holding him to that. He owes me a beer if they don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and uh, I was thinking about, we had this whole hullaboo last week about Jake sending a B team for the Champions Cup and the likes. And I wondered this thing where the Lions effectively used a B team, for lack of a better word. My friend that I spoke to last night said, it's not a B team, it's an alternative team. Let's be, let's be correct about this. You guys played an alternative team against Benetton uh, in, the, in, in the Challenge Cup uh, round of 16. Was that the right decision to make? Are the Lions still focused more on the UFC? Because I was thinking maybe they, they should focus on winning something like the Challenge Cup. Or they actually had a good chance to do that. And then maybe get, you know, just go through the motions to UFC, get the team to grow, get the squad to grow, get the more experience. Like I said, ex- soft moments get better due to experience. The more of those moments you experience, the less you will repeat those errors in future. Do you think they made the right, the right decision not to focus on the Champions Cup so much and rather go for the USC? What do you think? I do, yes, I do. I mean, we we were all quite surprised that they made wholesale changes. I mean, they were starting to get momentum in the USC. Then they brought in players that, first of all, hadn't played for a long time. And against Benetton, you can never underestimate a team like that anyway, whether it's in South Africa or in Italy. So a lot of us supporters feel that it could have been the wrong choice. They should have used a majority of the URC players, brought some of the fringe players in maybe, just to secure a win and get further into the competition. Mm. Now they come back empty hammed and they obviously have got all to play for in the URC. So I totally agree. They they had a, a golden opportunity to try and progress in the, in the Challenge Cup. It didn't happen. And now they've got their backs against the wall because we've obviously got tough oppositions waiting. You know, now that you mentioned that, it's a good good segue into what's what's waiting for them. And the very first team that's wait, that's waiting for them, be it at home at Emirates Park, is Leinster. And I think at the moment, if you mention the word Leinster, everybody goes, "Oh my goodness!" You know, it's uh, they seem to be unstoppable, almost a, it's kind of a juggernaut. I mean, they just wiped the Bulls off the field effectively when they were playing against them. Do you think the Lions might have any chance? And do you think Leinster will also be sending B teams to to South Africa to contest this tour of this? Yeah, like you say, I mean, when you mention the word Leinster, it reminds us of the Crusaders and their prime in Super mm, Rugby. Obviously, exactly. they're nowhere near where they were, but it's 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 the same type. Um, it's You don't often beat a Crusader side. They either have an off day or you've played out of your skin. It's the same type of thing, yeah. Leinster don't often lose. And 
going back, if I look at our last two games against them, they actually fielded a second team, if you like. Mm. Uh, we lost to them in Dublin 21-13, if I'm not mistaken. Very good game by the Lions. They pushed them, but it wasn't their first side. And then last year, we lost by three points to them at Ellis Park, 39-36. Once again, we, we took them close, but we, we, we didn't beat them. So if they came with their first side, I'm afraid to say, diehard support, uh, we're going to be in a, in, it's going to be a game and a half. But I believe they will probably send like a second team. I was reading on a, on a page today, some, I don't know if it was Rugby 365, where they were mentioning that their coach said he is going to give the guys that started off the bench probably a starting, you know, against the mm. Lions, and then give some players a chance that haven't played in the last few weeks. So there again, it's telling you it's a weekend side that they cannot be underestimated. But having said that, the Lions are desperate. I mean, I've spoken to one or two of the players and they said that they feel that they have disappointed themselves, they've disappointed us, and they've got no choice but to give it all. Um, and it doesn't get easier. Each game gets, it's tough. Yeah, and just after Leinster, lo and behold, another another Irish juggernaut is a monster. I mean, Eric is name on, I know, is here. He's going to play against the Bulls this weekend and I'm sure that he's going to pitch up there by Emirates Park as well. So, you know, yeah, they might be focusing on the URC, but they made it very tough for themselves. Monster and after Monster, it's Cardiff. Maybe that's a bit of a gimme. But Glasgow Warriors, make no mistake, they're second on the log at the moment. So I can't see any more difficult running towards the end of this of, of this tournament than the, what the Lions are facing. Absolutely. I mean, we know how good Franco Smith is as a coach. And I mean, that, that team is very well coached. So every one of these teams that we are going to face, we're going to be up against it. Even Cardiff. I mean, you cannot underestimate. I mean... We all thought they're going to beat Ospreys and look what happened. So the Lions are going to have to dig deep. They're going to seriously have to dig deep. And whether these teams send their B teams over because they feel they've already qualified and they, they're focusing on you know Champions Cup and that, whatever the case might be, um, the Lions are in for it. Um, all these teams they play are above them on the log except Cardiff. Um, and we know how good the Stormers play under Dobson. So... If you ask me, do I think they could make the last eight? I do. I believe out of desperation they probably could. But they are going to have to up their game immensely. They cannot have soft moments. They are going to have to give us a performance like they did against the Sharks and Connacht in every game until the end. Well, they're 11th on the log at the moment, but they're on 34 points. And from 7th to 11th is one point difference. 7 and 8, I think, are 35 points. And then the, the next few are all on 34 points. It's very, very close. It's going to be a bounce of the ball here or there. Making the top 8 of the URC means you automatically qualify for the for the Champions Cup next year anyway. The Champions Cup, not the Challenge Cup. So maybe that's why the Lions decided not to worry about that too much. Because they know that they're going to end in the, in the top 8 and get to the Champions Cup anyway. Yeah, that could have been their thinking. Um, as much as we were all saying, put in stronger teams in the Challenge Cup, Obviously, Ivan van Rooyen and his coaching team have got a goal they've set out you know, to achieve. And like you say, I mean, that's a massive carrot that dangles. If you qualify in the URC's top eight, you're going to obviously have your entrance into challenge into Champions Cup. And I mean, that's a massive competition. I was just thinking, um, what would you what would you change in terms of of, of the Lions, uh, of their players, they're doing something right there. And I, I, I always joke and say something, there's something in the water water in Alice Park. And a good example of that is, is Nelly Noamba and Marius Lowe coming from the Sharks where they sort of were also rands and, you know, sitting on the sidelines and look where they are today. I mean, Marius Lowe to me is an exceptionally inspirational captain. And Nelly Noamba will, in my, my opinion, most probably play against Wales for the Springboks in that first test. So they're doing things things right there, but they're also doing a couple of things wrong. They they tend to keep losing players. They just uh, you know lost uh, the Tutuka and uh, Jordan Hendrickson to the Sharks, uh, and they they've signed a few new players, but they seem to be almost churning too much. Although there seems to be a bit more be a bit more stability in terms of retaining players for the next couple of seasons. What you, what's the situation there? Yeah, no, definitely, I agree with you. Every year we seem to be building a team and we gain momentum, and then you hear three, four players are going and, and it's like almost starting from scratch again. But I must say they have got a lot of, well, they've got the majority of their players uh, signatures now. So if I'm correct, it's only Tatuka and Jordan that are leaving this time around. It's never good to lose quality like that, but 
They have signed like players on long-term contracts in our like your Marius Lowe, Sanele Nohambas, Frankie Horn, Henko mm. van Veik. So it's looking promising. If they can retain this group, they'll definitely be a force to be reckoned with. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear supporters saying, but I really believe we've reached a stage, if this group can stay together, it's a case of watch the space. Yeah, that's what happened with Akraman. Huh? He kept the, the group definitely. together. Also, people that uh, players that weren't necessarily first choice uh, players at any other union, and look where they ended up. They were desperately unlucky not to win a super super final. Quaho by getting that red card once and and the likes, you know, they could have gone, gone so much better. I agree with you. This 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 group is going to go far. The problem that I have is Loftus is is a, is a fortress. DHL Stadium is a fortress. Kings Park sort of becoming a fortress again. Emirates Park is one of the most imposing. One of the most historic venues in the world rugby wise and, and nobody's pitching what's your take on the Alice Park situation or Emirates Park situation what is the problem number one and what is the solution number two in your, in your opinion so I think it's probably twofold um the Lions supporters have always been very fickle they win and the stadium is packed out they lose and people will rather just you know go to a buddy's house and watch the game and have like a few, you know, drinks and a bra, watch it at a pub. But there's the other side to it is obviously the, the precinct. You know, it's, it's not a good area. The stadium itself is awesome. Once you're in there, in that cauldron, I mean, there's few stadiums and can match that atmosphere when it's full. Mm. I remember, um, there's been many occasions, but I remember in 2011 when the Lions beat a star-studded shark side in the Curry Cup final, it was packed to the rafters. I can't remember an experience like that in any other place I've been to. I mean, it was a Curry Cup game, but it was a final we won. So, yeah, um, I do believe that they are working behind the scenes to try and correct this. I know that there's a there's a group of people that have come together that meet quite regularly. Um, lines management, fidelity, security. I believe uh, City of Joburg are involved as well, where they're meeting regularly to try and get a solution to the security around that stadium, uh, make it more, you know, mm. supporter friendly and encouraging for families to come and watch. Uh, they are reintroducing park and rides because there's, there's not a lot of parking area in around Ellis park. And I mean, it's, it's dangerous. So they, they're trying to bring in park and ride again so that people can be picked up from different shopping centers all around. Um, but I think a lot of it is a fear of the area. Another part is obviously the Lions haven't been performing consistently. So yeah, we were, we were all, I actually put a thing on my page a while ago and I asked, what do you think the Lions should do? Should they move stadium? Should they maybe move to a smaller stadium and just you know build it up from there? And the majority of people were saying, move away from Ellis Park, go to a safer stadium, maybe a UJ or something like that. And even if it's 8,000, 8,000 looks better full than 60,000 when there's 2,000 in the stadium. But I believe Otman Allison have stuck to the to, to, to the um, fact that they're going to be staying at Ellis Park, but they've got to try and see how they can improve the area. And yeah, that's, that's where we are. But it's never nice looking at that imposing stadium and all you see is red seas. But Clinton, we've, we've run out of time, believe it or not. I mean, that went by quite quickly. I would never have thought I could talk about the Lions for so long. <laughs> yeah, I know it did. It was really enjoyable. And like I've said, I've, I really enjoy your content on uh, Megaphone Sport. And um, I'd, I'd be delighted to interact with you again in the future. Yeah, we're definitely going to have another chat. I love hearing some of the, 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 the story behind the story, like you just said to me. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you again. And thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Okay, everyone. Thanks for that. Thanks for watching with us. Uh, look out for our new videos coming. We've got a nice video about the 30 best rides the Springboks ever scored against Australia. Well, not ever, from 1992 to 2005. Look out for that. And uh, look out for other previews coming up soon for the Bulls against Munster this weekend and the Stormers against the Ospreys.